Uh, first thing, I, of course, should say it's a great honor and my great pleasure to be here and thank uh, Laura, who's just stepped out of the room, and Katie, uh, and the organizers for this uh, great meeting. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, an idea I've been looking at for several years now, and, uh, but it may be unfamiliar to most of you, so uh, therefore I'll spend a little time uh, with the background. But, uh, so there's a paper that goes back to 2001 when we first proposed this idea, published in 2004. There's a review article in 2010. Uh, but the work I'll talk about today is, uh, is actually uh, really quite remarkable. I, I feel it's remarkable, I hope you agree, is that the, this idea of uh, a condensate or uh, P equals minus rho interior to uh, a black holes, which is therefore not a black hole in the same sense, hence uh, the uh, quotation marks, that this idea is actually inherent in the second paper of Schwarzschild back in 1916. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today mostly. So uh, I think I'll skip uh, m most of this. You all know this, These, uh, that uh, classical black holes, of course, uh, have infinite tidal forces and a true curvature singularity at the origin. If I take the simplest possible case, the Schwarzschild uh, spherically symmetric case. Does this work? Yes. Um, and however, there's the, something new in general relativity. This, uh, the singularity at the origin is, of course, the same kind of singularity you get in electromagnetism with the Coulomb potential, but there's something new in general relativity, which is uh, uh, an event horizon where uh, uh, light rays cannot escape, and uh, this is, of course, why we call it a black hole. And the thing I just want to emphasize is uh, the change of sign of the metric functions as you go through the uh, horizon is, of course, uh, true if I have no stress tensor there, and you're, this is just the property of the vacuum solution. Uh, even in classical relativity, before we talk about quantum effects, of course I could have a sheet of uh, radiation uh, moving on the null surface at the horizon, and that would potentially change uh, what's happening inside. So I, I just want to emphasize this obvious point that uh, the solutions to Einstein's equations depend on the sources, and uh, what we call a black hole uh, uh, is dependent on having uh, nothing going on on the horizon. Okay, now again, uh, you're all familiar with this, that's why we're here, uh, but the uh, issues that come uh, when you try to put uh, quantum mechanics into this is uh, a fascinating interplay uh, of quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, and uh, general relativity. But I just want to call your attention to how striking and paradoxical these questions really are. If you come, you know, walk in off the street and someone tells you that this solution to Einstein's equations has an entropy, uh, you know, if he's taken, he or she has taken first year classical uh, mechanics or electrodynamics, they say, well, you know, if you have a Coulomb solution, does that have an entropy? Well, of course not. It's a single classical solution to uh, very simple equations and it doesn't, uh, you don't associate any entropy with it. But as we all know, uh, there are uh, no hair theorems in general relativity which tell us if we throw things into this horizon, uh, we end up with only a few uh, uh, parameters, mass, angular momentum, charge, and therefore, in some sense, one has lost all uh, information or data about what one has thrown in. And uh, uh, so, in, what sen in some sense, there seems to be an entropy associated with this object. And Bekenstein, of course, uh, suggested, uh, it's too bad uh, that he has passed away just before this meeting, uh, uh, but he suggested uh, this uh, very novel idea that the area should be associated with entropy uh, based basically on classical ideas about the increase of the area uh, from, fall, from uh, uh, dropping in classical matter, area is always going to increase. Uh, of course, uh, <laughs> again, I want to draw your attention to a very trivial, obvious thing uh, that is sometimes uh, not said, but should be, and that is that area is not entropy because uh, it doesn't have the right units. So I have to divide by something of units length squared, 
uh, in order to get something which is dimensionless and then multiply by Boltzmann's constant to get an entropy. Um, so what length squared should you use? Well, there isn't any in classical relativity, and so uh, the only thing you can think of doing uh, if you're starting you know, from scratch here is to divide by the Planck length. If I have uh, h-bar in the problem, now it's suddenly entered the problem. All of this was just classical, but as soon as I uh, introduce the Planck length, of course I have h-bar, and now I can talk about something at least which has the dimensions of entropy. And this was basically Bekenstein's suggestion, which uh, was, was certainly difficult to understand uh, uh, just on that basis, where that entropy came from. Then, as we all know, Stephen had this revolutionary paper in 1974 uh, arguing that a thermal spectrum comes out of a black hole, and once you have the temperature, uh, then, of course, the corresponding canonical uh, thermodynamic variable is the entropy, and you can write uh, a classical relation, which is that uh, relating the surface gravity, the area, and the energy, which is just this relation, you can write it, rewrite it, in terms of the Hawking temperature and the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy this way and fix the constant in the entropy, which is the famous one quarter. So it's one quarter of the area in, in natural units. I want to emphasize, I mean, we don't, you know, we're so sophisticated, we don't usually write all the units in, but maybe we shouldn't be because something pretty non-trivial has happened here. You started with a classical relation and uh, you've multi really just multiplied and divided by a, a, a factor which includes h-bar and now interpreting this as a quantum formula. So one has to be very careful here as what exactly is going on. So we usually just put h-bar to one, right? Now, as you all know as well, there are uh, so this is the part of my talk about what's the matter, what's the quantum matter with black holes, is we all, you all know there's a list of problems. So I won't, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're here to discuss these problems, but just the list is, uh, as uh, people have pointed out repeatedly over the years, if you follow the Hawking quanta back to uh, near to the horizon, you will, be just, just because things redshift coming out, if you go back, uh, they blue shift, and uh, eventually you're talking about frequencies which are, uh, in principle, infinitely large and bigger than the Planck scale. So that's one issue. Should you believe the semi-classical approximation and that uh, applies to uh, particles or quanta of that frequencies on a fixed background? Second thing is uh, we've, we've talked about it also for 40 years, essentially, is uh, this area formula is very is fascinating, but it's also very peculiar. If you uh, uh, talk to you know other physicists in other fields like uh, chemists or uh, condensed matter physicists and ask tell them you have this formula that the entropy is proportional to the area, uh, that looks very puzzling because uh, usually entropy is proportional to the volume, an extensive quantity, not the area, and usually it's proportional to the number of degrees of freedom somehow that you put into the system. So if I had three or four more neutrino species, I would expect uh, the entropy of the system to increase proportional to those number of species. But the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, of course, doesn't have any room for that. It's, uh, it's given purely in terms of uh, fundamental quantities. The other thing you should do while we're doing these elementary exercises is put in numbers and recognize how big this entropy is. I'll put that in in the next slide. Uh, again, thinking uh, in terms of physics of other, uh, other systems, uh, this temperature is very small, as you know, uh, and uh, so this system is cold. It's thermal, but cold. On the other hand, in the same limit that the temperature goes to zero, which means a very heavy uh, black hole, or h-bar going to zero formally, just because I've multiplied and divided by h-bar, uh, as the temperature goes to zero, the, the entropy goes to infinity. So uh, that also sounds strange to, to most other physicists. How do I have a cold state which has essentially an infinite number, uh, a very, very large number of degrees of freedom excited in it? Uh, as Stephen himself pointed out in the 70s, uh, the energy, uh, since the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass, mass is energy, so uh, 
energy is inversely proportional to the temperature, and therefore the EDP is negative. Now, again, if you open up standard uh, thermodynamics books, in fact, going back to Einstein himself and fluctuation dissipation relations, the, uh, the EDT is uh, essentially the heat capacity of the system, and that, for any uh, 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 stable ensemble, is just related to the energy fluctuations, E minus E bar squared. So it's positive. Uh, so how does it uh, become negative here? And in fact, if you look at the, uh, not just the sign, but the magnitude, uh, it's supposed to tell you, in other systems, it tells you something about the time scale uh, of which uh, things can go unstable, and this time scale is basically nothing else but the uh, dynamical time scale, the light crossing time of, of the black hole. So this looks uh, also very strange if you think about ordinary thermodynamics. Uh, one can ask, can equilibrium thermodynamics be applied at all to this system? Then we, of course, have the information paradox, the question of whether information disappears, mixed states appearing from pure states, unitarity, where is, where is this information stored? And, you know, standing in the back of all of this somewhere is Ludwig Boltzmann with his, uh, this uh, epigram on his gravestone uh, asking, well, where's my formula? How did you count the states? Uh, the logarithm of what quantity is this entropy? So these, these uh, questions remain, I think, after all these years. We've had a lot of suggestions, but uh, I, I would say, to my mind anyway, no definitive answer. So uh, let me just do a very simple-minded argument. Again, this is very simple just to, to give you a, a, a uh, try to keep things at a, a, a very basic level to start with. Um, if I try to estimate the entropy of a self-gravitating system, uh, either in the microcanonical or the canonical ensemble, it doesn't make any difference for a large enough system, uh, then uh, the simplest thing to think about is something like black body radiation. And again, just order of magnitudes, the energy is uh, the volume times the temperature to the fourth, uh, the, the uh, Planck law, Stefan Boltzmann constant here, and the entropy is going like the volume times T cubed. So I can eliminate the temperature if I don't know what the temperature is, and I write the entropy in terms of the volume and the energy this way, just do the simple math, and the volume is, of course, going like uh, the radius uh, cubed, so I get this relation. And if I think this is a, a self-gravitating collapsed object, the energy is the mass, and the radius is the Schwarzschild radius, then I immediately get the entropy is going like the three-halves power of the mass. And in fact, if you look at uh, Zeldovich's book, Zeldovich and Novikov, that is uh, the entropy of a relativistic star, a star of a, a mass of about 50 to 100 solar masses, will be dominated by its radiation pressure and this is its entropy. This is a bigger entropy than the entropy of the sun because the sun is a main sequence star, which is, uh, whose particles are not relativistic. It's not dominated by its radiation pressure, and the entropy is less. Anyway, uh, this looks like a kind of a, a maximum that you can get from relativistic relations. It's a three-halves power. So here's where you put the numbers in. Uh, the Bekenstein-Hawking formula going like m squared. Again, it's m over m Planck square root, that's uh, the difference between these two. And this is a factor of about 10 to the 19 for a solar mass object. So uh, somehow one is supposed to count up the number of states and get uh, the logarithm of the number of states to be 10 to the 19 bigger than what you would get by a naive back of the envelope calculation. Granted, this is naive, but uh, it shows you uh, how far you have to go. Okay, so now go back again to first principles and think, uh, are we sure that this is what's going to happen? And of course, uh, the basic uh, foundations of black hole physics were laid uh, in the 60s, and Stephen and Penrose, Roger Penrose, were very influential in that, and, and the famous singularity theorems were proven at that time that uh, Penrose, for example, back in 1965, proved on very general grounds, uh, if you assume the weak energy condition and the trapped surface forms, uh, then uh, they will have to be geodesically uh, incomplete uh, geodesics and therefore uh, presumably a singularity. 
However, this is violated, we know, uh, by quantum field theory. For example, Casimir effect is an example which doesn't obey this Ken energy condition. Uh, uh, Stephen and Penrose proved another version of this using the strong energy condition in 1970. Uh, and this is a very interesting energy condition because, again, it seems pretty reasonable for most matter. However, we know that this is violated, for example, by dark energy. Uh, and now we're more comfortable thinking about dark energy. It seems to be there in the universe. If you think about inflation, it has P equals minus rho. Uh, and, and this quantity is less than zero rather than bigger than zero. Uh, it's somewhat less well known, I think, in this community, but a fact that even in hadronic physics, uh, if you look inside uh, uh, a hadron, inside of a proton, uh, there is a, a, a vacuum energy. It's, of course, negligible gravitationally, but uh, it is a P equals minus rho condensate due to the gluon condensate uh, in QCD. And so there's another very uh, well-established example uh, in which uh, this energy condition is violated. So the important point is that uh, you, again, will get a black hole forming uh, if you have certain conditions on the energy momentum tensor. You can't, uh, you can't say anything unless you say something about T mu nu. And it was pointed out really a long time ago in the 60s, prior to inflation, really anticipating what we now call inflation by uh, uh, Zeldovich and Sakharov in the Soviet Union, that if you had a negative pressure uh, vacuum-like energy equation of state in the early universe, then you would avoid the initial singularity. So they were thinking, both uh, Zeldovich and Sakharov were thinking about singularities uh, in uh, the early universe and uh, also in gravitational collapse. And there's, of course, a great similarity between them. And uh, therefore, if you had negative pressure, uh, you, would, uh, you would not have the initial singularity. And Sakharov and then Gliner realized that if that happened inside of a, a collapsing object, it would defocus geodesics and you would have, have a, an effective repulsion. So the same effect which is causing the universe expansion to accelerate could actually uh, eliminate singularities in uh, a collapsing object. So I won't trace all the history, but basically in the early 2000s, we were thinking about uh, uh, analogies of between gravity and condensed matter physics, thinking about all these uh, issues with black holes. And uh, again, I'll give you a naive heuristic argument, and then I'll show you some uh, results. I want to get to the Schwarzschild solution, which is really curious. Um, if you think in a, in a sort of naive physical way, then you know, gravity is a theory of bosons. Uh, it's, it, it's an attractive interaction between them. Uh, the interactions may become strong. There are various ways of looking at this. Uh, but even a very weak interaction generally leads to uh, uh, some sort of condensation phenomenon in other systems. So uh, it's, it's not, I think, totally crazy to think there could be quantum correlations which lead to the formation of a condensate in gravity in the same way that you have uh, interactions that lead uh, to superconductivity or superfluidity. Uh, if there were such a thing, what would it look like since we don't have the full theory, we're just trying to argue uh, on, in physical terms. Well, if you have an order parameter, and the order parameter is a scalar, we want to, we want to uh, uh, be consistent with general relativity and general covariance, so it has to transform in, in a simple way. Let's assume it's a scalar. Well, you already know the answer now from inflation, right? If you have any scalar, like the inflaton, with a potential, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, and, it, and its uh, spatial time derivatives are negligible, then that just enters the Einstein equations as P equals minus rho, as an effective cosmological term. You then look at the Gibbs relation, which is a general relation for uh, entropy density and, uh, and pressure. And uh, you, if you have no chemical potential, then the Gibbs relation looks like this. So it tells you if P equals minus rho, you expect this to have zero entropy density, okay? And indeed, that's true in, uh, in other systems. But zero entropy density means you have a single macroscopic state. You have a, a coherent state where the log of the number is zero. And therefore, this is a condensate. If you have P equals minus rho, 
it can be reinterpreted as a condensate in these uh, condensed matter terms. And as we just said, if P equals minus rho, uh, uh, P being uh, negative, then this uh, energy condition is violated, and you can have a repulsive core. So a condensation of any kind that produces this, uh, uh, as uh, Sakharov and, and uh, Seldovich were thinking of back in the 60s, would lead to a repulsive interaction. And uh, as far as the gravitational forces are concerned, and you could end up with essentially a bag, a self-confined uh, condensation in which the trap is gravity itself. And so we call this idea gravitational Bose-Einstein condensate, and uh, these are, again, just general physical ideas. I want to show you how it's realized. Uh, so we proposed this back in 2001, and now today I'm going to talk about how this can actually be shown to, to come about in Schwarzschild's second paper. So you know he wrote two papers in 1916 before he died. One of them is the famous exterior solution, we all know, but he also, uh, he also looked at the interior. He didn't know how to solve the equations, so he assumed the simplest thing, which was constant density. So let's go back and look at static spherical symmetry. Uh, there are two metric functions in general. I call them f and h, you remember, from the metric. Uh, and I can always call h in this form, where m of r is the misner sharp mass. Uh, the energy momentum tensor for spherical symmetry uh, it has three functions in general, the energy density, the radial pressure, and the transverse components of the pressure, which need not be the same as the radial one. And you write down the Einstein equations and the conservation equation. This is basically just pressure balance. Uh, and you get three equations for these five functions. So it's, of course, not yet determined. Now, before I go to the Schwarzschild case, uh, there is a very important and interesting theorem proven about that set of, uh, of first-order equations by Buchdahl back in 1959. So he made essentially the same assumptions that there's a static killing time. He's looking for a static solution, uh, uh, spherical symmetry. Uh, he assumed isotropic pressure, so he did put all the pressure components equal to each other. That eliminates one of the unknown uh, functions. Uh, and then there's only, one, there's only one unknown left. And you can then prove that if the uh, uh, energy density is a non-increasing function uh, of radius, d rho, d rho dr less than or equal to zero, then, and, and you also have continuity with the surface of the star, uh, assume everything is continuous at the surface and you match onto the exterior Schwarzschild solution, then one can prove a theorem, which is, that the radius of the star, we call it capital R, has to be bigger than 9 eighths, this number comes out, 9 eighths the Schwarzschild radius, or the pressure diverges in the interior. This is a necessary uh, condition for the pressure not to diverge in the interior. And the interesting thing about this uh, is that this 9 eighths is, of course, bigger than 1. So this uh, uh, issue of what happens to the pressure inside is, is uh, taking place before you reach the Schwarzschild radius, before it's a black hole. This is still uh, just a, a static star. Whatever the equation of state is, that's why this is a powerful theorem, uh, it's assuming spherical symmetry, of course, but whatever the equation of state is, uh, it, uh, you have to have the radius be bigger than 9 eighths the Schwarzschild radius, or you don't have uh, a static solution in which the pressure is everywhere finite. So let's look at the case which uh, saturates this bound which is the case where d rho dr is equal to zero. In other words, rho is a constant. Well, that is what Schwarzschild did back in 1916. Uh, he, he looked at the case of a constant density interior. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that this uh, Buchdahl bound says that under adiabatic compression, so I imagine I have a sequence of stars, all of which are static at different radii, uh, no matter what the equation of state is, uh, again, this is a this is, uh, has the same features as the singularity theorems. No matter what the equation of state is, quite generally, under these assumptions, uh, something has to give at the central pressure before I reach the horizon under this adiabatic compression. So uh, I'll just go through the Schwarzschild solution because it's interesting to see what you get. This is in textbooks. It's in Bob Wall's book. It's in Weinberg's book. 
And this is what the solution looks like. It's a very simple equation you have to solve, which is that pressure balance equation. And it, you get just this ratio of square roots, OK? Very simple. Uh, H of R is like this. The, uh, this is a constant density, so the misner sharp function is growing like R cubed. It becomes equal to capital M at the radius, capital R. And you notice something very curious about this, that uh, as long as R is, capital R is bigger than 9 eighths again, this denominator here never vanishes on the real axis, and it's a perfectly reasonable solution. But when you reach this magical value of 9 eighths, then this denominator vanishes, first at the origin, uh, and that's usually enough for people to then stop talking about it. That's what happens, for example, in, if you look at the textbook. But we went further and said, OK, let's just keep going. Suppose the radius is smaller than 9 eighths. What happens? What happens is that this 0 moves out from the origin and becomes, at a finite radius, r naught. Okay? So if r is less than 9 eighths, this, is, this r naught is greater than 0. Uh, but you see, as r approaches the Schwarzschild radius, this becomes the Schwarzschild radius from inside. So as I push the, the object from the outside be, be beyond 9 eighths, uh, within 9 eighths, uh, the Schwarzschild radius, this singularity of the pressure starts at the origin and then grows outward. And at the point at which the uh, exterior radius is the Schwarzschild radius, at that very point, this, this singularity goes to the Schwarzschild radius from the inside. So what's going on? So should you just throw this out? Well, that's what most people did. We just went back and looked at it. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that the other radial function, the other metric function, f of r, which is the redshift factor, gtt, uh, this is proportional to the same denominator here squared, squared, which means it vanishes at the same place, and uh, it's always positive otherwise, other, other than this one radius. And moreover, because this is just a simple difference of square roots, what happens uh, is that a new solution opens up inside, which has pres negative pressure. So this, this uh, just changes sign. And inside this radius, the pressure becomes negative. This is just following the algebra of Schwarzschild's solution. So you can plot this and just play with it and see what happens. So for greater than 9 eighths, the pressure is very reasonable. Nothing is happening. Uh, but as you increase, as you, as you approach 9 eighths, what happens is this pressure at the origin starts to diverge. Okay? The central pressure blows up. And as you go beyond 9 eighths, this central pressure that blows up at a finite radius, and inside that radius, you have a negative pressure region. And moreover, as R goes to the Schwarzschild radius from above, R naught goes to the Schwarzschild radius from below, and the pre negative pressure region just fills up the whole interior and, in fact, becomes P equals minus rho. It just, just a feature of the, of the solution. Okay. So uh, this, this is the metric function. It has a cusp-like behavior because F is d squared, the denominator squared, so it's always positive other than this one point, and this point moves out in the same way uh, as that uh, place where the pressure uh, is diverging. So the redshift factor has this cu cusp-like behavior. And now you can ask what happens uh, for all of these uh, sequence of solutions, what happens also in the limit? So uh, in the limit, you get, as I say, p equals minus rho interior. You get a, a static patch of the sitter space. The only thing that's curious is that instead of time uh, the usual static coordinates of the sitter, f is equal to h, but in fact here f is equal to one quarter h, and this will turn out to be important. Uh, so it's uh, nothing else but a coordinate reparameterization of the interior time, but the interior time is not arbitrary, it's fixed by the boundary condition at infinity. It's the same t that goes to Minkowski space uh, in the asymptotically flat region. Okay, so time runs slower inside. And now the important thing to look at is whether or not this uh, singularity is a reason to throw things out or what, what it actually means. Well, for that, you look at the Komar 
mass energy flux, which is basically the analog of Gauss's law for, for static geometry. So you can write, uh, you can define the uh, surface gravity this way, and of course it becomes the ordinary Newtonian uh, acceleration far from the black hole, but otherwise it's given by this, and uh, this object obeys this equation, which is the analog of the Poisson equation. So you see that all of these uh, terms in the stress tensor act as sources for it, and this very particular combination of metric coefficients. And now what is important is at the same point that the pressure is diverging, uh, like one over the denominator linearly, the F, you remember, is going like D squared, so the square root of F is going like D, so this cancels. So this is totally integrable. The Komar energy is integrable, even through this singularity. And what's going on there is that there's a discontinuity because of the cusp. There's a discontinuity in, the, uh, in, in this quantity, uh, which you can think of as generating a transverse pressure. So however you look at it, when you uh, uh, look at the uh, discontinuity in the derivatives of the surface gravity, that leads to the conclusion that you cannot maintain a uh, 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 isotropic P equals, uh, uh, all the P's equal to each other, but the transverse P has to be different from the radial P. And the difference is just localized at one point, which is where this cusp is by the discontinuity in derivatives. So this is just a boundary layer. It's a delta function boundary layer with a surface energy because, of course, the delta function is integrable which is equal to this for the general case. And as uh, uh, R naught goes to R, this just becomes twice the mass of the object. So what is going on is that, of course, the total mass is fixed by the exterior uh, boundary condition. What is going on is that you're just distributing that mass in a different way between the volume piece and the surface piece as you vary uh, uh, the total radius, as you vary R naught, and uh, at at this uh, limiting case, in which you have the Schwarzschild radius, this is minus m and that's plus m, so that the total is just, again, m. Okay, now you go look at the surface gravity, and it's discontinuous, uh, just coming from this discontinuity in f, and the discontinuity can really be interpreted as a surface tension now, and that's what, uh, what my remark yesterday after Malcolm's talk, that in this case, uh, at least, there is sense to talk about uh, the discontinuity in the surface uh, gravities as a surface tension. This is a real surface tension now because I have a transverse pressure. So it really is uh, the, the surface tension of the of this surface. Uh, and, and of course, because of this cusp, the interior is not the analytic continuation uh, through the, of the exterior. And so you can now go through the same argument uh, of Jim Bardeen, Brandon Carter, and Stephen uh, back in the, uh, in the 72 or so, and look at the uh, infinitesimal form of this. You just go through the same steps, and you see that you can write the total uh, differential of the mass energy as a volume term and a surface term. And this now really is a surface tension. So it's not the surface gravity itself that sh should be identified with the surface tension, but the discontinuity in it. And this essentially generalizes uh, the small relation uh, from uh, the case of a black hole to the case in which you have this uh, interior uh, condensate. And I remind you, this really should be thought of as a condensate because it has no entropy. So the Schwarzschild interior solution actually describes in this limit, in modern terms, a zero entropy, zero temperature condensate. The discontinuity in the surface gravity is non-analytic. Uh, is really the surface tension, not, the, not a temperature in any sense, and the surface area is the area, not the entropy. This just has a classical mechanical uh, interpretation. I don't have to divide or, or multiply by h bars. There's no Boltzmann's constant in this. It's just classical mechanics applied to this relativistic uh, self-trapped system. Okay, that just comes out. I also mentioned that one can change the coordinates and write uh, the solution globally this way, introduce a new radial coordinate called C, uh, which is just defined in terms of the radius this way, uh, such that the surface is at C equals zero, but you notice this is a Rindler-like form. If I expand near C equals zero, uh, where this is one, Q is near one, 
So it looks like Rindler space. However, it's crucially different from Rindler uh, and flat space because C, doesn't, C squared does not change sign as I go through uh, as I go through C equals zero. C is just a radial variable which remains real and uh, for, for uh, uh, interest of, the, of people who know about junction conditions, this actually serves as an example to generalize the Israel junction conditions to a null surface. So th this is a perfectly reasonable boundary layer which uh, is C1. In other words, uh, the, func the metric and the first derivative of the metric are continuous and, and the discontinuity in the second derivative is just measuring the uh, uh, transverse pressure and the surface tension. So I would say this is faithful to Einstein's equivalence uh, as he originally conceived it for real coordinate transformation. There's no analytic continuation here. Curiously now, you can look at the geodesic equation and uh, uh, just see what happens to null rays as they, as they strike the surface, and they go through. Uh, uh, so you can just match the geodesics on interior and exterior, and because the interior is a region of de Sitter space, uh, you can just uh, find the angle of refraction, and it acts like a, uh, uh, it acts like a material which has an uh, index of refraction less than one. In other words, it bends the rays away from the normal. So it defocuses rather than focuses. So if you look at a, a series of null rays, it will, this cartoon will show you that they basically, an image will be, it acts as a, as a defocusing uh, lens. What does that call A concave lens, I guess. Uh, so that if there's an object behind here, it's actually going to defocus it. This is, of course, completely different imaging characteristic from a black hole, which would uh, absorb the light uh, on the outside, uh, the rays are going to behave just like the black hole because the exterior is Schwarzschild, but if uh, the rays penetrate, you get a completely different uh, picture. So, this idea that we had of uh, uh, an interior condensate is in some sense realized just by pushing it a little harder uh, with modern techniques is realized in the interior Schwarzschild solution and you can now look at this relation and ask yourself various questions, like well, uh, this is just a delta function layer at this point, but notice it's very important that the surface tension came out positive. I, that's the way it came out. And that means that the energy is minimized by minimizing the area for fixed volume. This is, uh, there are actually two canceling signs, but it comes out the same way as it does for an ordinary soap bubble. Okay, a soap bubble is stable, under, it has small oscillations, but it's stable because if I try to uh, change the area, the, uh, that costs me energy. And here, the same thing. The, the surface tension comes out positive so that if I try to change the area, keeping the volume roughly fixed, that's going to cost me energy, and therefore I expect the system uh, to, to actually be stable. The surface tension acts as a restoring force. So uh, it's, of course, now an interesting question to try to go beyond this and calculate the small fluctuation, but just heuristically, uh, the characteristic frequency has to be the same frequencies that uh, uh, Klaus Kiefer was talking about this morning, uh, basically of order of magnitude of the, uh, the quasi-normal mode frequencies, which means that this would be a striking signature if we could observe such objects, then it would be uh, have a discrete gravitational wave spectrum. So the situation here is, you know, curiously reminiscent of uh, the Bohr atom, right? Classically, uh, of course, electrons fall into uh, the Coulomb potential and matter would be unstable, but matter is quite stable and ultimately that's because of quantum mechanics, because of, of the uncertainty principle. So here, the suggestion is that quantum mechanics again comes to the rescue and uh, produces a condensation phenomenon which would stabilize a black hole so things don't fall in. And just like the Bohr atom has discrete frequencies, this object should have discrete frequencies. So this is a potentially observable signature to test the idea. So a bunch of remarks. You should tell me. Time's up? Okay, if time's up, I'm just gonna end with a slide or two. I was going to try to discuss how, uh, how one could realize this now in an effective theory, 
Uh, but let me just make a few remarks and I'll stop. So first of all, the non-analyticity is very similar to what one would guess in, uh, in condensed matter physics. So people like Bob Laughlin and Chaplin had similar ideas, but rather than uh, talking about an analogy, this just is coming out of the solution of, of general relativity in, uh, in, the, in the Schwarzschild solution. So because the, the killing vector is everywhere time-like, except possibly at one point, a Hamiltonian exists. If the Hamiltonian exists, it, it's emission with proper boundary conditions. Uh, it should, def it should uh, certainly, uh, uh, for any field put on this background, describe unitary evolution. Uh, I should also mention that because things are non-analytic uh, right at the surface, there's no reason to demand analyticity of Green's functions, and so one would expect that the quantum state of a test field in this uh, background is more similar to the Bohr state, doesn't have to be exactly Bohr, but similar to it than it is to, say, Unruh or the hartle hawking state. Uh, of course, in such a state, the energy density is again negative and violates the weak and strong condition. Now, uh, what I was going to talk about next, I'm out of time, is putting quantum effects into this. This is, of course, a very simplified model. Uh, if I now put h-bar into the system, I expect that this uh, infinitely thin boundary layer is going to get regularized by uh, uh, essentially the Planck length divided by a small parameter epsilon, Planck length divided by the Schwarzschild radius, and uh, that will mean that the physical uh, thickness, because of the metric factor, the physical thickness is going to be the geometric mean of the Planck length and the Schwarzschild radius, which is quite a bit larger, of course, than the Planck length. So one might still be able to think about this in an effective field theory approach very far from Planck scale physics, although you do need to put the Planck scale in at some point. So this epsilon will regulate uh, uh, this behavior, uh, uh, this cusp, and round it out. Okay, so this, uh, this is the effect of field theory. I'll mention just uh, another side remark, is that uh, if you look at the bag constant in, in uh, QCD, it's got a number something like 75 MeV per Fermi cubed, and so this should be going on inside a neutron star if you start uh, approaching uh, the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit and the, central, and the density, just from my uh, simple constant density Schwarzschild solution, is this value. So for a mass of a few solar masses, this is within about a, an order of magnitude. So you could even imagine that uh, QCD itself, gluon condensation, uh, and the back constant is actually generating this uh, interior P equals minus rho condensate, but you'll probably need more than that, and then you have to uh, do gravity itself. So that's where I was going to go next. I'll skip it, unless you have questions. And just sum up. So the Buchdahl bond tells us that under adiabatic compression, interior pressure divergence develops before the event horizon. The constant density interior solution saturates this bound and shows the generic behavior, put in your favorite equation of state. It just means something is going to happen before you reach 9 at a, a larger radius. The infinite, it's very important that the infinite redshift uh, takes place, or blue shift, takes place exactly at the same point where the pressure diverges. The Komar uh, integral is, uh, is, uh, is integrable as a delta function singularity, a non-singular interior, and the differential form, then, of the, of the uh, energy is just nothing else but essentially classical mechanics generalized to relativistic system of a mechanical surface energy and not entropy, at least in this uh, realization. And of course, there's no problem with uh, unitarity or quantum mechanics and the information paradox just poof, gone away, okay? Uh, and this is already there in the Schwarzschild solution uh, and so our suggestion is nothing else, that this could be the cold quantum final state of gravitational collapse consistent with quantum theory and, and general principles. And I would uh, uh, like to show you a little more of how I can do that in, in a more, uh, in a fuller theory, but maybe I should end here and one can start speculating about what this might mean uh, for astrophysics. And it's very curious 
and interesting that one might be able to tell this apart from black holes by both the gravitational wave signals being discrete, by imaging, and as you know, uh, we've already discussed, there is the possibility, very exciting in the near term, next few years, of actually imaging uh, the central object in our galaxy, Sag A star, uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope. So uh, the provocative idea I want to put out there is that black hole and dark energy problems are related, and maybe it's the same mechanism that solves both problems. It's done. Thank you. Yes, Gary. Is there a chair? You're the chair, so you tell. Yeah. It was working. Okay, I wonder if you have a material where the density is constant. Does that mean that it is incompressible and yeah. that therefore the speed of sound is infinite? Yeah, that, so that suppose you impose a constraint that the speed of sound should not be bigger than the speed of light. Then what you get? I mean, yeah, I'll repeat the question. In fact, that was, that was Einstein's uh, objection to, to Schwarzschild's second paper. Uh, he didn't like it because a constant density meant exactly that, which violates, of course, relativity. So I don't think to, this should be taken seriously. At, oh, did I not repeat the question? Okay, I'll repeat the question for you, Katie. The, quest, the question is, if you have a constant density, uh, that means the system is incompressible. If it's incompressible, that means the speed of sound goes to infinity. And of course, the speed of sound cannot be faster than the speed of light. L let me answer his question first. Okay. So that's, of course, true. So, so these uh, intermediate states, uh, which I went through the sequence of solutions, I don't think are, are physical. It was simply a model to get to where I want to get to. Now, once you get to the De Sitter interior, you don't have this problem because the De Sitter uh, system uh, does not, I mean, it's a vacuum. So there is no speed of sound that you can calculate that way. Right? If you just take pure De Sitter space, uh, I don't know what the speed of sound is. It's, uh, it's ill-defined, in fact. So you have to put some material in. But the vacuum itself has no speed of sound. So I think I, I perfectly agree this is not a sensible, each one of these members of the sequence is not sensible. But I would like to take seriously the limiting case as, as, a, as a dark energy interior. You, Francesca, you, no, you should please. tell. Yeah. Well, let's see. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, on your last remarks, I was a little confused about whether you're suggesting the, uh, that all the things that we think are black holes are really these yeah, objects. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go way out on the limb and suggest that. So yeah. you're thinking that all, yes. of, all of the things in the centers of galaxies are really yeah. these and not black. There yes. are the, you solve the black hole uh, problem by not having any black holes anymore. Is that it's it? nothing <laughs> short of that, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a speculation, to be sure. But there was, a, there was a comment the other day, I think, in Laura's talk, Laura's also vanished, but uh, about uh, whether or not black hole horizons have been observed. And of course, I'm intensely interested in that question. And I would say uh, the issue is still open. So astrophysicists think they can argue that they, there's an event horizon, but the argument goes something like this. We know something about accretion on, on several of these objects. So something is falling in. But then, it should, if it were to hit a surface, it should thermalize, and then we should calculate the flux and see what's coming out. And there's no thermal radiation. Therefore, there's no surface. That's roughly their argument. Of course, that depends on what happens to the material as it hits the surface. Does it thermalize? Does it get bounced back? Does it uh, re-radiate? Or does it get absorbed? If it gets absorbed, then, uh, or mostly absorbed, you won't see it. At least in, uh, in classical relativity, you can form black holes of extremely low density. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it would seem hard to see why the physics that gives rise well, to this I was special phase would, would apply if, if we tried yeah. to make sufficiently large. Well, I was going to try to explain that, but I ran out of time. Uh, the, the, the point is that the vacuum polarization effects, as you well know, for example, in a bowler like state, always get large near the horizon, no matter how big the black hole is. It's just a matter of getting closer 
uh, you have to, this epsilon parameter gets smaller, so uh, you, have to, you have to make this f of r smaller before it blows up. But there's always, no matter how small the curvature is, this is a quantum correlation effect which has nothing to do with the local curvature, ultimately. It has to do with non-local correlation, which I think are described by the conformal anomaly. But that's, I think, how I would, like, I would get to it. But, but I agree, it's a challenge to, to understand how this is formed, uh, and I'm, I'm, that's, of course, the open problem I'm working on, but I think, I think the possibility is there. First, it's, it's been yeah. Just a remark, it's not mine, by the way, uh, about the constant density that this remark came from the book of Mr. Tom and Wheeler, the gravitation. When you solve the Einstein equation, even you have a solution with wall for constant, that's just you can imagine some specific matter such that voice constant, but the, and the pressure is a mechanical pressure. It's not the thermodynamical one. What you need is actually a, a state equation of state to know what. The yeah, here there's no equation of state. I just solved the equilibrium, yes, so, so we cannot, hydrostatic we equilibrium. Cannot say anything about the velocity of of sound if we don't have any equation of state. And the fact that both of them. That's true. It's not the problem. Th that, well, okay. I mean. It's one reason I think the Schwarzschild solution was cast aside for many years because the master uh, Einstein didn't like it, and uh, for this exactly the point you raised. But I, I think that that simply doesn't arise in a De Sitter universe. We don't talk about the speed of sound of dark energy. It, ha it has no speed of sound. Yes, Mike. Michael. Normally, you think if you have a theory of elementary particles where the particles are heavier than the Planck mass, they would qualify as black holes. Does your theory rule out those two? No, I have, I have nothing to say about Planck scales. I'm not trying to solve the problem of quantum gravity all the way to the shortest distances. I'm trying to work in an effective language for large black holes. Sorry, I thought I heard you say there are no black holes. Well, okay. <laughs> and if we talk about Planck scale black holes, I, I have no idea. I mean, uh, so, the, so I, I tried to say that the, that the thickness of this, uh, of this shell is the geometric mean of the Planck scale and the, and the uh, Schwarzschild horizon radius. So it's very small, it's like Fermi for, uh, for astrophysics, but it's very large compared to the Planck scale, and there we should still be able to do something like uh, uh, semi-classical methods, and the, and it's your favorite topic, the conformal anomaly, which comes in there. So <coughs> I want I want to not cancel the anomaly, at least at these low energies. I want to use it in the same way uh, I I have an effective action in low energy pion physics, which comes from QCD and the triangle anomaly, chiral anomaly. I want to use the conformal anomaly to to mm -hmm. tell me something about these effective quantum correlations. Uh, I have no time. Well, no, uh, I'll do whatever the chair says. <laughs> well, a but, question but there's from a discussion. Norma? Yeah. yeah. Could you draw the conformal diagram of the space time? Uh, not easily enough, uh, because this region is, uh, is, is completely blown up in the conform because the rays, you know, what you should do is, is, make, uh, is put in a, a regulator. If I put in this epsilon, uh, um, then, then the surfaces are really, are really space-like tubes, and then I can draw a conformal diagram. If you take it literally to be null, uh, I'm not sure how to do that. So it's an interesting little exercise. We can do it, but I haven't done it. Can you draw it with the regulator in place? Yeah, I think so. I think then it's just a star. It's a star. You, have, you, have, so a region of, you have a region of De Sitter and you have a region of Schwarzschild separated by some finite boundary, which is space -like. By some time-like like, uh, boundary. With a time-like, yeah. yeah. If you take that limit, it's kind of tricky, so you have to be, you have to be careful. Yes, Jim. Uh, so do you have any uh, ideas about <laughs> what would happen astrophysically <laughs> if something like this existed in terms of what 
what sort of signal you would see. Well, well that's what I discussed. If there was, was accretion, for instance, on well, the other side. Well, okay. Now, so in order to talk about matter, this when astrophysicists want to know is what, what happens with rotation, what happens with magnetic fields, and what happens with matter. All great questions, and I've only scratched the surface on that, and I'd love to hear, uh, you know, some, some ideas. Basically, uh, these are speculations. I don't see any reason why the system could not uh, support currents, for example. So, so the way uh, m black holes just absorb energy and the magnetic field collapses may not actually be the case if you have, if you have something like a real current sheet there. But that involves putting the standard model interactions into this surface, which is going to take a lot more work. Uh, but I think it can be done in principle. The first thing I'm trying to do is actually construct, uh, actually it's your, it's, it goes back to your talk also, Garrett, with, uh, you, you mentioned the monopole and how you get a singular solution until you put in some extra term that regularizes it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do, to put in the extra terms coming from the anomaly and the back constant, essentially, and demonstrate a non-singular solution. Once you have a non-singular solution, then we can talk about small fluctuations in a meaningful way, and we can talk about interactions with standard model fields, okay? But at the moment, with this very simplified model, I can't do that. I don't have enough physics in it yet. So the only thing I can say qualitatively is that if it's a closed surface uh, and I, I hit it, it should act like a soap bubble. It should, it should oscillate and at, 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 at normal mode frequencies without an imaginary part, as in the quasi-normal mode description. And that is a stunning signature, if you would ever see it in gravitational waves. So okay. uh, your, your condensate, um, I think you just answered my question, but <laughs> I'm not sure. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you, the properties of your condensate uh, is just given by gravitational quantities, the, the Planck mass speed of light, h bar, or, or are we waiting until you include the standard model? Yeah, I, I, I try to, I, I try to uh, motivate uh, the, the idea that a condensate could form even from QCD, because we know there are such condensates in QCD. No, but I mean and the... So, so that's, that's sort of starting the process. But no, the, 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 the full answer has to involve standard model fields, the conformal anomaly, and the formation of a condensate of... Uh, so, the per, so the parameters... They're, they're going to interact with each other. It's not just pure gravity. It's not just pure so, standard so, model. So the parameters of this condensate are not just pure gravity? Uh, well, if this object exists at any scale, uh, then, then the condensate has to be density, I mean, it has to be density dependent, has to be able to adjust. So, so yes, in that sense, it's the gravitational effect that's dominating. So it may be seeded by, by standard model processes, but in the end, this has to be, this has to be a gravitational object, right? With it, where I can discuss it all in terms of the gravitational field equations with some corrections. That's what I, that's, that's the goal anyway. There was a question from Gerard. According to general relativity, there are many other ways to make a black hole. Like you could simply collide two very energetic particles and make a black hole. My favorite is a cloud made of television sets <laughs> as large as the galaxy. Uh -huh. And you let these television sets attract each other gravitationally. Mm -hmm. And while they go through their own horizon, the, the, material, the, the cloud is still so dilute that all television sets are still working. In other words, ordinary laws of physics apply while they'll go through the horizon. All you use is the principle of general relativity that yeah, coordinates are equivalent and nothing more. But you're assuming and then you get already okay. that they have to go through the horizon. Am I assuming something? Well, you're assuming classical matter. You're assuming essentially an energy condition. You're assuming that well, I have ordinary, ordinary particles. The energy conditions they can be television sets, but they're just ordinary yeah. the particles. The energy conditions them is, is trivially satisfied by those television. They're yeah, sure. classical objects sure. that you don't really understand. Sure. And they're very dilute, so the density is much less but, than that of water. And but, still, you can But make the point is here, the dilution is a, is a local concept. It is not what determines whether or not this condensate forms. So the question is whether, uh, you know, in the preparation of the quantum state, 
which is not in your description with television sets, whether or not the, the quantum vacuum can produce vacuum polarization effects near to the forming horizon, which can trigger this process. And that's not in the classical picture at all, right? What, but would that, be that's wrong? what would be wrong with the television set solution? What would be wrong is that leave out the quantum effects. So that, the, so that it, there's nothing that tells you that quantum effects have to be small on macroscopic scales. Because we have superconductors, right? They say, what would be wrong with assuming that, you know, a cold superconducting system behaves classically? Because there are quantum correlations that are not behaving that way. But here we are. Okay, here we have a system, a, system, a, a substance that we think that completely under control, we understand everything of it. But now you say we understand nothing of it, it's, it's something happens with large differences. Uh, yeah. I still can't quite grasp what uh, it is. I, I grant you that's the challenge, I grant you. But, but I was going to try to describe uh, uh, how the conformal anomaly and vacuum fluctuation could produce exactly that effect at, for any scale. I mean, if for this to work, it has to work at any scale. It has nothing to do with whether, I mean, except the Planck scale, but anything larger than that, uh, it, has to, it has to be the same mechanism, essentially. So here, I agree, it, I, I chose a sequence of, of uh, configurations and adiabatically compressed them, which, uh, well, I think, I think this is a reasonable thing to do also for stars. But if you want to do something else, like throw television sets in, then I have to do a different calculation and show, we're trying to do that right now, looking at 2D collapse, it may not be sufficient, it may have to go all the way to 4D because of the transverse pressure playing an important role. But that's the question, whether or not vacuum fluctuations and the, and the polarization effects, which I think are encapsulated in the anomaly effect of action, can actually do that. So those are the effects which are left out, of course, from, from the classical picture. But I, I agree, that's a, that's a challenge. It has to be shown. It has not been shown yet. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, I think it's very intriguing to have these uh, new uh, theoretical objects that we could go searching the universe for. <laughs> uh, great to find them. But uh, as against whether all black holes, so-called now, could be explained this way, I have very strong doubts, uh, particularly because by now you, you concentrated mainly on the equilibrium states yes. and yes. a little bit of perturbations away from that, but nothing substantial about how you would form them in, in real Agreed. practice. Yeah. Right. On the other hand, we've been worrying about uh, conventional black holes for so long that now there's a lot of studies on how to form them. And uh, I think there are computer models. Classically. Of, of, uh, classically. Yeah. Classical computer models of ordinary yeah. type material found in uh, large mass stars yeah. uh, and how the core will collapse and so forth. And there's those no, all seem very plausible. Th there's no doubt, Charlie, if you take classical matter and classical right. relativity, you will get black holes. There's no doubt. Right, okay. But there's no, once you have taken that, if the quantum mechanic doesn't come in and cancel some of the assumptions you've made under reasonable conditions where you think you know what's going I know. on. I agree. Uh, why the black hole will have formed and the quantum mechanics can't come in and undo the, uh, the uh, horizon once it's actually been formed. So I agree. So uh, I think it would be very strange if all black holes could be substituted. I, I think it's a different things. form of the question Gerhard is asking. I mean, the, so you're challenging me to show you on, uh, you know, take some uh, other situation, like throwing matter in, Oppenheimer, Snyder, yeah. call them television sets right. or air conditioners, it doesn't matter. The question is, how do the quantum effects arise near the horizon uh, that can trigger something like this? And that, I agree, requires a different calculation than anything I've shown you. It's a much harder yeah. problem. Uh, it also requires an imagination that, yeah. that the horizon can be sensed by the matter while it's trying to obey the can, laws can of be physics. Can be and sensed by the, quantum, by the quantum vacuum polarization, which remembers from where it came, uh, namely an initial state 
uh, with a very, very uh, diffuse form of matter, almost Minkowskian. Well, that, that's all you need. I look at, uh, supposedly, so, there are 10 billion solar mass black holes uh, in the catalog that people think. Now, for something like that, the, uh, the uh, scale is uh, about uh, 15 hours for the light crossing time. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, the curvature at the horizon, predicted horizon, is much weaker than the curvature in this room. But, but, I, but I, keep, I, keep so saying, I keep saying that you the curvature has nothing to do with it. Okay. It's a non-local effect. But how, I can't imagine how All right. something thrown in is going to feel this non-local effect before the horizon is formed. If, well, <laughs> I can't show you the left half of the talk, but I'll be happy to tell you the idea. Now, whether the idea works, I'll you know, freely admit I don't know yet. Uh, so so it's, that's the challenge. But that's a hard problem, you agree, right? It's a much harder problem. It's, it's easier to look for static solutions under a lot of symmetry right. than it is to solve a dynamical problem. But, but we, we, we are thinking about exactly this problem. Okay, so I, I have ideas, I can tell you about them, I haven't solved it. So um, I worked with Cosimo Bombi on something even more speculative. So this was motivated by a talk that I heard by Peter Harava in Berkeley, um, where in string theory that you could possibly have super spinning black holes with the spin bigger than the mass, and the issues of event horizon and singularity I won't touch, but what we looked at was the observational consequences and what it affects is the shadows of black holes. If you have something behind the black hole, then you've got this black region that you can look at. And so in that case, instead of having a sort of relatively spherical shadow, you would have slivers, and you could tell the difference. So I guess this, it's just, I'm just thinking about observational things. I don't think that would, would happen here, but then I also remind you that LIGO's coming up, the gravity waves, it might yeah. be another test, I don't know. So just yeah, throwing all this out there. It's up there, yeah. Oh. Yes, so it is. <laughs> when, when you do those light rays, yeah. you mean light really goes through it? Or yeah, it? light really goes through. Oh. What about unless, the unless, of course, that's geometrical optics. The, real, the question is whether what actual photons would interact with the matter, yeah. then they could be scattered and it would be a more complicated situation. So all I did there was solve the geodesic equation. Uh, so it's just geometrical optics without any scattering. The, how it scatters, of course, is a question of how, how it interacts with ordinary, with matter on the surface. You know, uh, would you agree that if LIGO does see a gravitational wave burst that wa with a waveform that can be agrees with the standard <laughs> generalistic calculations? All right, put me on the spot. For, yes. Corresponding to a black yeah. hole merger. Put me on that the that spot. would uh, destroy your model. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're anxious to do that, uh, so let's let's. Just <laughs> uh, it will, yes, of course, will be. I mean, I think we have to put these ideas to test. Okay, we have to stop talking, if you excuse the phrase, in a vacuum, and and and, and start, uh, you know, making predictions and see if it works. It, so on the one hand, there are theoretical issues that have to be addressed, and uh, that's very challenging. But on the other hand, it's time to start putting these things to the test. And if one doesn't see anything like this, that, of course, argues against it. Thank you. Is the horizon that you're considering an event horizon, or? No. No. So I mean, so, so, this, this, uh, so you're asking about the, the idealized Schwarzschild model, or you're asking about more realistically, if I regulate it with some finite? So the, the thing I showed has, a, has you know, in a sense, a, a, a marginal horizon. It has exactly one radius, the Schwarzschild radius, where uh, things become null. And uh, so it's, if you wish, a marginally trapped surface, but there are no surfaces inside which are trapped. Now, if I regulate that a little bit by, by pushing it away from zero, then there are literally no trapped surfaces. So, so it's, it's a locally, no horizon. It's a locally defined. It's locally defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah. I don't need uh, to talk about what happens in infinity. Of course, this was this was a static solution, so it's kind of trivial. Yes. Um, 
Presu presumably, in your model, there's no there's no particular limit on the angle of momentum uh, versus mass relation. Like yeah, I, I can't solve course. the equation for rotation yet. Okay, but, <laughs> but uh, astrophysically, it is observed that most uh, most astrophysical black hole are very close to the extreme Kerr limit. Yes. Uh, so that that seems to be a, a piece of observational evidence in favor of the black hole hypothesis and against you and against your hypothesis. Well, well why do you say that this one have uh, it might have a very similar limit? Okay. But I don't know. I don't know. Okay, but you haven't shown that yet. No, I haven't shown that because to try to generalize this to uh, rotation is a much more complicated uh, problem. And it just hasn't been done. It, it did take 50 years to go from Schwarzschild to Kerr, so, you know, give me a break. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard problem. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, by the way, an interesting thing which can be done, it's uh, tedious but possible, is to put slow rotation and just see how things behave uh, just to get some feeling. That, that's a well-defined problem. But, you know, if I had a student, I would uh, <laughs> try to get them to do it. More questions? Uh, yeah. How do you want to solve the dark energy problem? Ah, you want me to get even more out of them to speculate. Okay, so. I, or if we do that after the party. You should probably do that after. But, <laughs> but, but, but obviously, obviously to, for this to work, I need, I need uh, vacuum energy to be dynamical, right? I need it to. It's not a constant, it's not a cosmological constant. It's, it's something which depends on the external conditions, on the boundary you conditions. Want to have to every place? What? You want to have the condensate? Yeah, so now you know, you're in the condensate, yeah. <laughs> Except there's matter and radiation and you know, so you have to re rethink a lot of things. I, I, we haven't done that. <laughs> so we are in the discussion time already, so even if you have questions that are on a broader topic, they are welcome. Oh, well, sorry, since we haven't done this yet, maybe we should thank uh, Emil again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So yeah. we're in discussion. So. Yeah, so if there are more <laughs> broader uh, questions, they are welcome. And you are free to help yourself with coffees and so on. No more questions? So at, at the, last night I was <laughs> looking for a good way to end this, and I found this. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, just one thing, at, um, the fact that the light is defocused de does mean that light goes faster than coordinate frame light. So uh, the index of refraction is less than one. Yes. Cents. Yes. So that, that suggests that the speed of light inside this object is faster than the coordinate speed of light. Ah, that's interesting. Not that that's, a, that's an object, that's I not directly an objection, it's just yeah, an observation. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's, yeah, it's an interesting observation. Can that be used for something? I don't know. <laughs> the, the other thing I could mention is if I, I went too fast, but uh, if, you, if you had this you know, literal uh, delta function, of course it would still take an infinite time to reach, uh, an infinite coordinate time to reach uh, the horizon. It would still be this. However, as soon as you put in a finite epsilon, uh, that time becomes logarithm, a logarithm of epsilon. So there would be a time delay. So in addition to the defocusing, uh, if you had a transient source behind, and you could compare the light signals going past and the light signals coming through, there would be a significant time delay in the light coming through. Another, another just kinematic effect of, of that. that enough? Yeah, I think if there are no urgent questions, it would be a good idea to close early the, the session today because we have to be on time at the banquet tonight. I'm happy so. to discuss any more of this as you wish. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much.